Sonnet 18, or Shall I Compare Thee, by William Shakespeare, was first published in 1609 in the collection Shakespeare's Sonnets, never before imprinted. Although the poems were likely written over a period of years, possibly starting in the early 1590s. In the poem, Shakespeare explores themes of beauty, love and the passage of time, as his speaker debates whether to compare the object of his affections to a summer's day. He immediately, however, rejects this conventional comparison outright, reflecting on the unpredictable nature of summer. The only thing that is certain about it is that it's short and that its beauty is bound to fade. He ultimately asserts that his beloved's beauty transcends all these natural limitations and promises him immortality instead through his lines of verse. Ironically, Shakespeare had no way of knowing the extent to which this sonnet would be celebrated, nor how profoundly true his words would become, as generations have continued to find solace and inspiration in his portrayal of love and beauty, ensuring that his own poetic legacy would indeed live on. Sonnet 18 forms part of a sequence of 154 sonnets, the first 126 of which were addressed to the fair youth, while sonnets 127 to 152 were addressed to the unnamed dark lady. There's no compelling evidence as to the identity of either of these figures. A number of candidates for the fair youth have been proposed, including Henry Risley, Earl of Southampton, and William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, while others have argued that he is simply a composite or fictional figure, a literary creation embodying ideals of beauty, youth and love. The nature of the love expressed by Shakespeare's speaker in the first 126 sonnets has sparked much debate. While the language is often intimate and passionate, the question of whether it reflects platonic love, romantic love or an erotic attraction remains open to interpretation. The intensity of the emotions expressed in some sonnets hints at complex feelings that some read as homoerotic. The speaker admires the youth's beauty in a way that seems to go beyond simple friendship, potentially reflecting deeper romantic or sexual desires. It mustn't be forgotten, however, that homosexuality was illegal during Shakespeare's time and that sexual relations between men were a capital crime. Many scholars instead argue that Shakespeare's admiration for the fair youth is primarily platonic. This view sees the sonnets as celebrating idealised love, friendship and beauty, rather than physical or sexual attraction. Expressions of love between men in the Renaissance period could be quite affectionate without being erotic, especially in poetry, as friendship between men was regarded as one of the highest forms of human connection. It was not uncommon for men to express admiration, affection and even love for one another in ways that modern readers might interpret as romantic, but which were seen as normal and virtuous in that period. Sonnets enjoyed a golden age in England during the Elizabethan era after their introduction by Thomas Wyatt in the 1550s. Love was the theme of many of them and a popular subject was the description of a loved one's physical beauty through comparisons to things found in nature and heaven. By the time Shakespeare was writing, however, these tropes had become cliched and predictable. Shakespeare, known for his originality, often subverted these conventions. In Sonnet 18, he begins with the familiar comparison of his beloved to a summer's day, but quickly moves beyond this, critiquing the inadequacy of such superficial imagery. Instead, he focuses on the idea that poetry, rather than nature, can immortalise beauty, offering a more sophisticated and lasting celebration of love. This fresh approach shows Shakespeare's tendency to challenge poetic norms, elevating the sonnet form with deeper insight and complexity. 
poem is an English or Shakespearean sonnet with 14 lines comprising three quatrains and a rhyming couplet. It has a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, which Shakespeare strictly maintains. It has a base meter of iambic pentameter, didum, 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 didum. Although Shakespeare does vary this rhythm in places with metrical inversions, which is where, for an example, an iam, didum, is effectively flipped to become its mirror image, i.e. a trochee, dumdi. All lines are end-stopped, which means that each poetic line features punctuation, e.g. a question mark, a comma, a semicolon, or a full stop. This means that the reader is required to pause at the end of each line. This resulting lack of enjambment and caesura give the poem a measured, deliberate pace, reinforcing the speaker's thoughtful and reflective tone. The measured structure mirrors the speaker's calm contemplation of the beloved's beauty and the enduring nature of poetry. This deliberate pace allows the speaker to carefully build his argument, emphasising the timelessness of the beloved's qualities. The strict rhyme scheme and end-stop lines create a sense of order and control, which contrasts with the chaotic and unpredictable elements of nature described in the poem. By maintaining this formal consistency, Shakespeare subtly underscores his central claim that the beauty and immortality of the fair youth, preserved through verse, will endure far beyond the fleeting imperfections of the natural world. The poem begins with what appears to be a rhetorical question. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? The reader's expectations are immediately set. The speaker will, as convention dictates, list using a series of metaphors and similes all of the qualities of a summer's day that exemplify the man's beauty. Shakespeare, however, turns these assumptions on their head. It isn't a rhetorical question, used as an invitation to himself to extol the virtues of summer which he believes his love embodies after all. Instead, using a rhetorical device known as hypophora, he's actually asking himself a direct question. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? To this, he implicitly responds in the negative, no, I shan't, by dismissing the suitability of a summer's day as a vehicle for a comparison out of hand. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. In other words, he argues to compare him to a summer's day would not do him justice as he is lovelier and far less prone to extremes, i.e. he has a much more even temper. Note the use of diacopy in this line, where the repetition of more emphasises the inadequacies of such a conceit. The colon at the end of the second line indicates that he will explain what he means by this bold assertion, and over the next six lines he enumerates Summer's shortcomings and, therefore, its unsuitability to be used as an extended metaphor. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. It can be far too windy in the early summer, he argues, and this can violently shake the budding flowers, threatening to destroy them. The adjective darling here suggests that these buds are both precious and delicate. The sense it gives of something cherished or beloved emphasises both their fleeting beauty and their vulnerability. Not only this, but summer just doesn't last long enough. The word lease refers to a period of time during which something is temporarily possessed. This metaphor thus emphasises summer's transience, another reason why this is an unsuitable comparison. The speaker now turns his attention to the way in which the weather during the summer goes from one extreme to the other. 
Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines. The metaphor, the eye of heaven, refers to the sun in this image. In other words, sometimes it's simply just too hot. More often than not, however, as anyone who has spent the summer in England will attest, it's overcast with cloud and is therefore just too cold. And often is his gold complexion dimmed. Here, the gold complexion is another metaphor for the sun, highlighting its warmth and brightness. The word dimmed suggests how this brilliance is frequently obscured by clouds, symbolising the inevitable decline of even the brightest and most beautiful things. Shakespeare's personification of the sun in the phrases the eye of heaven and his gold complexion cleverly parallels the features of a face typically singled out for flattery in conventional sonnets. In doing so, he subtly suggests that the fair youth's eye never shines too hot, perhaps hinting at the youth's delicacy and modesty. Likewise, the youth's complexion is never dimmed, always appearing fresh and bright. By highlighting these contrasts, Shakespeare argues that comparing the fair youth to a summer's day is inherently flawed. While the sun is subject to extremes and imperfection, the youth's beauty is constant and untarnished, transcending the limitations of nature. This further strengthens Shakespeare's argument that the beloved's beauty cannot be captured by such a fleeting and imperfect metaphor. He continues by considering the inevitability of the fading of physical beauty. And every fair from fair sometime declines. This line can be a bit difficult to access on first reading for a number of reasons. First, Shakespeare uses anastrophe. This is where there is a deliberate inversion of the word order for poetic effect, which effectively separates the subject of the sentence from its verb. Second, a few of the words Shakespeare uses are either unfamiliar or have changed in meaning over time. And third, he makes use of a repetition technique called polyptoton, which is where a word with the same root is repeated, but which serves different grammatical roles. So we'll take these issues one by one. If we reverse the anastrophe to put the sentence back into its normal order, the first line reads, and every fair declines some time from fair. It still isn't crystal clear, but we're getting there. Now let's get on to the vocabulary. The word fair in this context is to do with beauty rather than something that is just and unbiased, which is its more common current meaning. To further confuse matters, Shakespeare's repetition of the word is polyptotonic. In other words, the first fair is being used as a concrete noun to denote beautiful people or things, while the second fair is being used as an abstract noun to denote the concept of beauty itself. The adverb sometime means eventually rather than every now and then, and the verb declines means lessens in, i.e. loses in this context. In modern English, then, we would render the line and every beautiful thing eventually loses its beauty. In the next line, Shakespeare elaborates on why beauty must fade. By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. It can happen by chance, by an unforeseen turn of events, such as perhaps an accident or an illness like smallpox which was prevalent during the Elizabethan era and which often left its survivors disfigured with pockmarked skin. Even if you're lucky enough to avoid these misfortunes, the one thing you can't escape is the inexorable march of time. During the process of ageing, physical beauty fades as the skin loses its elasticity and the fresh complexion of youth is replaced by wrinkles and broken veins. Shakespeare uses a sailing metaphor to convey this idea in which nature is a boat on an unstoppable cyclic voyage. The Elizabethan era was the golden age of seafaring and exploration, 
and Shakespeare makes extensive use of such imagery in his drama and poetry. Trimming a sail involves adjusting the angle of the sail in response to the wind to optimise the boat's speed and efficiency. And so the verb untrimmed here suggests that, in what was a pre-Botox era, nothing can be done, nothing can be adjusted to alter the course or the ravages of time. In the same way that summer invariably gives way to autumn, nothing can stop our journey towards old age. We now reach the volta of the poem, signalled by the coordinating conjunction but, which indicates that Shakespeare is going to introduce an idea that opposes what he has previously stated. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Note how here in the sestet he repeats language from the octave, i.e. summer and fair, but he will reframe the meanings of these words as he claims to have found a way to preserve beauty in his beloved after all. He continues, Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. Here Shakespeare personifies death as a self-complacent braggart, one who boasts about his ability to claim victory over every living person. Note the use of the metaphor shade to suggest the darkness brought by death in contrast to the beauty, light and life brought by the sun. The anaphoric nor, which begins lines 10 and 11, builds the tension as the poem reaches its climax, as not only then does Shakespeare boldly assert that his beloved will never lose his beauty, but also that he will become immortal. How can this be? He has just definitively stated on lines 7 and 8 that no beautiful thing is immune from the passing of time. What he has just presented to us is a paradox. He reveals his solution in line 12, which is that he will beat death through immortalising his beloved in verse. When in eternal lines to time thou growest. We are now no longer talking about physical beauty and its inevitable decay. These eternal lines to time are not the lines and wrinkles that we find on our faces as we age, but the lines of poetry within which he will preserve the fair youth's beauty for posterity. Rather than declining, his beauty can now only grow, presumably as his fame increases as future generations read about it. And here we still are, over 500 years later, with the imagery just as fresh and inspiring as it was then. The poem ends on a rhyming couplet, which resolves the paradox. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. He doesn't mean that he will defy death in the conventional sense by keeping the fair youth's physical being alive, but as long as there are people living who are able to read, this will give the poem life, and in turn, this will ensure his immortality. His use of anaphora in this rhyming couplet, with the repetition of so long, gives the poem a sense of closure, while simultaneously emphasising the enduring power of poetry. The repeated phrase reinforces the idea that as long as humanity exists, the sonnet will continue to preserve the fair youth's beauty, transcending both time and mortality. This creates a powerful contrast with the earlier depiction of natural decay, as the speaker triumphantly declares that the beloved's essence will live on through the written word, immortalised for future generations. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.